We're going to have a special message this morning, being that it's Father's Day. We're going to take a journey through some selected fathers of the Bible. And Lord willing, we'll have time to go through nine of them. Nine of them. First of all, we're going to start with the first father of the Bible. What's his name? Adam. Adam. Adam is, we'll call him the guilty father. Then we're going to go through Noah, the courageous father. And then the grieving father, the sacrificial father, and on and on until we finish our message. <clears throat> the guilty father. Let me just read out of Romans chapter 5. I can just read that for you. As an introduction to Father Adam. Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore just as through one man. That's Adam. Sin entered into the world. And death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Adam is guilty of eating the forbidden fruit and plunging all of his children, all of his posterity into sin and death. Let's look at his first child. His name was Cain. Genesis chapter 4. Adam's first child. And Cain immediately, well maybe not immediately, but eventually committed murder. And Cain is kind of a prototype of all of our sins. He inherited a sin nature from his father, Adam. And because of inheriting the sin nature, he committed acts of sin. Same with you and I. We inherited a sin nature, and because of that, we commit acts of sin. We're not sinners because we sin. We're sinner, we sin because we are sinners. Now let's examine Cain. Chapter 4, verse 6. We see three things here that the sin nature produces in all of us. Genesis 4, verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, oh, I like this right here, Sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you. But you must master it. Sin is crouching at the door like a leopard. Like a leopard. I was talking to my son this week. He's in India. He'll be coming back the 5th. Of July, but he's in India right now, and uh, he was there a couple years ago, and he saved two dogs, and he wanted to find them because he had given these two puppies to a family there, and he wanted to go back and visit them. Well, he found one of them. The other one he hadn't been able to find, and the people in the village said, "You know, at night the leopards come down, and they're big leopards." And they hunt dogs. These stray dogs that roam the villages of India are some of the main food that leopards out there 
eat. So he's thinking, I found one of my dogs, maybe the other one is in the belly of a leopard. Because the leopards at night, people don't walk, they don't go out at night. There's leopards, there's pythons, there's huge lizards. I go, it sounds like the jungle book. Because that's the way it is out there. But the leopards crouch at the door. That's sin. Sin crouches at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now God is working with Cain, counseling Cain, trying to get Cain to repent of his sin because God had rejected his offering. Cain is angry and God is working with him and saying you've got to master this anger it's crouching at the door of your of your life and its desire is for you you've got to deal with it God is counseling Cain now a lot of people you counsel them and it doesn't do any good it didn't it didn't it didn't help Cain because he was mastered by his sin look at verse 8 Cain told Abel his brother and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Literally slaughtered him. Cain rejected and ignored God's counsel. And that's a prototype of people today. They ignore God. They ignore God. Secondly, verse 9, the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Sound like one of your kids? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Imagine talking to God like that. Sarcastic, irreverent, disrespectful. I don't know where he's at. He had just killed him. He knew exactly where he was at. And so did God. He was irreverent, disrespectful, and sarcastic. That's another prototype of people's sin. Not only do they ignore God, but they're irreverent and disrespectful to the things of God, like those fake nuns at Dodger Stadium the other night. Getting an award. Nobody was there to see it. Irreverence, disrespectful, sarcastic to the things of God. And then in verse 10, when he's judged by God, look at his response. He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. You're being too hard on me, God. What's he doing? He's accusing God of injustice. My punishment is too great to bear. Too great. The end of verse 14. Whoever finds me will kill me. Well, he just finished killing his brother. People today accuse God of injustice. So we see three things here. Father Adam passed on to Cain a sin nature Cain became a murderer and demonstrates some very familiar traits that you and I can identify. He ignored and rejected God's wisdom. He was irreverent, disrespectful, and sarcastic to God. And he accuses God of injustice. That's the same song and dance people do today. Adam, the guilty father. Now, how can, we, how can we apply this? How can we apply this? 
Be careful that you don't pass on to your children your sinful propensities. There's such a thing as generational sin. Generational sin. Break the cycle. Break the cycle of your sin so that you don't pass it on to your children. It's not just your problem. You're going to pass it on because they, they're going to catch it from you. Generational sin. The guilty father. Now, on a more positive note, the courageous father. Look at Genesis 6. We have nine beautiful fathers here. Don't be too hard on Adam. Yeah, he started the whole ball rolling, but... You and I keep it going. Well, not only do we give our kids the gift that keeps on giving, a sin nature, but our sinful habits, they catch as well. Here we go. Number two, the courageous father. There is, he has to be the most courageous man in the Bible. Noah. Noah. Genesis 6, verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be, what? A hundred and twenty years. From the time God spoke to Noah till the time the flood came was a hundred and twenty years. What happened during that time? Well, Noah did two things. He built the ark. And he preached. It says in 2 Peter, he was a preacher of righteousness. He built the ark and he preached the gospel. He was a preacher. And he did that for 120 years in very, very dark times. How dark? Chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, man was so evil. Everything he thought, everything he did was evil continually. The Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. God was grieved. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land. From man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky. For I am sorry I've made them. Noah ministered for 120 years in very dark, dark Times. We think we live in dark times. You haven't seen anything yet. Utter depravity. Utter depravity. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, that's the background of Noah. And his courage is on display. Verse 9, Noah lived a righteous life. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was a righteous man because he lived in obedience to God's righteous standards. When everybody else was living in sin, Noah lived in obedience to God's righteous standards. He swam against the current his whole life. He was righteous. God gave him his own righteousness. And because of that, he did righteous deeds. He lived righteously in the midst of a very evil world. That takes what? 
courage. You know, at work, everybody's sinful and doing their thing. You're, you're the only Christian there. It takes courage. Not only was he righteous, verse 9, he was blameless in his time. Blameless in his time. In other words, nobody could say anything bad about Noah. He had integrity, he had character, he was blameless. He had a sterling reputation. He was blameless in his time. He was blameless. What's your reputation? Not here at church. Everybody's good here. Everybody's good here. How about out there in the world? How about out at work, in the neighborhood? What's your reputation? He was blameless. Finally this, he had a close personal relationship with God. Verse 10, Noah became, actually uh, verse 9, Noah walked with God. So he was righteous, he was blameless, and he walked with God. Only one other person in the Old Testament is it said of that. Chapter 5, 24, Enoch walked with God. What is it to walk with God? To live in close personal relationships with God. He had a close personal relationship with God. He was a courageous father. Courageous father. Now, thirdly, how about the grieving father? Job chapter 1. We're, we're doing a whole survey. Survey through the Old Testament. Job chapter 1. Verse 1. The grieving father. Job was a wonderful father. He was a great father. He loved his children. He had seven sons, three daughters. He loved them all. Job 1 verse 1. There was a man in the land of us. Whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. He had ten kids. He had a lot. He, he was wealthy. He was wealthy. Verse 4. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. Now this is a miracle. They all got along. Seven sons, three daughters, and they all got along. They would rotate from house to house having fellowship and having barbecues and feasting. They loved spending time with each other. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters. They loved their sisters. They were invited. They had a close personal relationship. All the brothers and they'd invite the sisters to eat and to drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. He prayed for each one of his sons and daughters. Just in case they were in sin, he'd pray for them. That's a great father. Something happened. Verse 18. 118. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness, struck the four corners of the house. It fell on the young people, and they died. All of them. All ten. All ten died. 
in this catastrophe. They all died at one time. Can you imagine the grief of this father who loved his kids, who prayed for them? The grief. Look at his response, verse 20. Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshiped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Wow. Was he grieving? Yes, he was. Did he blame God? No, he did not. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. He put his face in his hands, and he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was grieving though. The grieving father. He's a great example to us fathers. Do we pray for our children like he did? Maybe they've sinned. Not maybe, we know they've sinned. Our children sin. We gave them the gift of a sin nature. And sometimes they indulge in that sin nature. And they do acts and lifestyles of sin. We've got to pray for them. Pray for them. There comes a time when you can't get to them because maybe they're adults and they don't live with you and they're, they're doing their thing out there. You can pray. You can pray. You just keep praying. Pray that God brings them back to himself. Whether they come back to this church or to another church, it's okay. They come back to God and that's all that matters. They come back to God because someday they're going to meet God. They're going to be held much more accountable, especially if they were raised in a Christian church. They're going to be held to a higher standard because they walked away from a greater light than some other kid that never had it. The grieving father. And then the sacrificial father, who's that? Abraham. Abraham. Genesis 22. Now, Abraham and Isaac are a beautiful picture of God the Father and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis 22. Verse 1, now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, here I am. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham said, what are you talking about, God? I waited a hundred years for that young man. You want me to go and sacrifice him? Is that what Abraham said? No, what did he do? Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and off they went to do what God told him to do. Absolute, unequivocal, Obedience. Obedience. Now, Abraham lived 2,000 years before Christ. And he is a picture of God the Father and God the Son. Look at verse, verse, uh, look at verse 1 again. Verse 2, take now your son, your only son. Verse 12, verse 12, I'm trying to make a point here. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him for now I know you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. And then verse 16 says the same thing. Your son, your only son. Now, Abraham had another son. 
What was his name? Ishmael. And you probably had other sons. Why does it say Isaac is your son, your only son? Your only unique son. The son of the covenant. It's a reference to the uniqueness of Isaac. He is your one, your only, one of a kind, unique son. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ was called. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His only son. His only unique son. Now, you and I are all called sons and daughters of God. We are sons of God by adoption. Jesus is the only son of God by nature, for he is God. So Isaac is the only son of Abraham, just like Christ is the only son. Beautiful picture. Look at verse 2. Take now your son, your only son whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. Moriah. Where's that? That's where Solomon built the temple. How do we know that? Second Chronicles. Chapter 3, verse 1. Moriah. Second Chronicles. I can just read that to you if you'd like. 3, verse 1. See, some of these are harder to find. All right, 3-1, especially if you have fumble fingers. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord, the temple in Jerusalem on Mount what? Moriah. That's where Isaac was going to be sacrificed. The same place where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac was the same place that Solomon, hundreds of years yet in the future, would build the temple. The temple. The temple of the Lord. The temple where animal sacrifices would take place. Now, look at verse 9, 22 verse 9. They came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar. Actually, go up to verse 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. Isaac carried the wood on his back. What did Jesus do? He carried the cross. He carried the cross. He carried the wood also. Isaac carried the wood. Isaac wasn't some little boy. He was a grown man. He was a grown man. Abraham had Isaac when he was 100 years old. Sarah was 90. She dies at age 127. That's 37 years. So from the time Isaac was born, when she's 90 years old, to the time she dies, when she is... 127, that's 37 years. Somewhere in there, Isaac and Abraham went up to the mountain. Now because this takes, because this is such a parallel to Christ, it is possible that Isaac was almost 30 years old. He was a grown man. He could have overpowered Abraham. But he lays down on the wood and he allows his father to bind him and to sacrifice him or to potentially sacrifice him why he's a willing sacrifice he's a willing sacrifice he didn't resist he didn't resist verse 9 they came to the place of which God had told him Abraham built the altar arranged the wood bound bound his son Isaac who's 30 years old probably how could he do that Isaac willingly surrendered himself. 
just like Jesus, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. That's a picture of Jesus Christ voluntarily surrendering himself. Total trust. Now, we've got to skip on here because we've got a few more fathers. Um, I want to I want to skip down to father number six, the permissive father, second first Samuel, first Samuel. If you don't know where that's at, come on. Wednesday nights we're going through first Samuel. The high priest was named Eli. First Samuel chapter two verse twelve. Now Eli, he was the high priest. In the early days of Israel, before they had a king. Now he had a couple of rotten sons. Not like any of you. Your kids are all beautiful. You don't have any rotten kids. But he had some rotten kids. To the core. Hardcore rot. Chapter 2 verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And the custom of the priest with the people, when any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would thrust it into the pan or the kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. They abused their position, these two sons. Our daddy's the high priest. We're going to be the high priest someday. We're going to take all the choice meat we want. We're going to abuse our position. We're going to bully God's people when they come to sacrifice. We're going to take the best of their meat. Look at verse 22. Now Eli was very old and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel. How they were abusing the Israelites. He heard it. And how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. They were abusing the women. They were raping them. These guys were out of, these guys were out of hand. In verse 23, he reprimands them very gently. He said to them, Mijitos, why do you do such things? The evil things that I hear from all these people, everybody knew about it. No, my sons, my darlings, no. For the report is not good, which I hear the Lord's people circulating. And it goes on. He mildly corrected them. Mild. Very mild. Well, because of that, he got himself in trouble with God. Verse 29. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me? You honor your children above me. God told Eli. He was a permissive father. You honor your kids above me. Lots of people guilty of that. Lots of people guilty of that. You have a Christian home. Your kids grow up in your home. They become adults and they become like Eli's sons. And they desecrate your home. Your home becomes a habitat of sin. And you allow it all to happen because you love your kids. Instead of saying, hey, if you're going to live that way, you've got you to fly the coop. You've got to go do it somewhere else. You can't do it here in this. This is God's, this is God's house. I can't, I can't allow this to go on here. You've got to do it somewhere else. But many times we turn our heads the other way because they're our kids and we love them. And God says, you honor your sons above me. You don't want to get yourself in trouble with God. Now, look at go down the go down the road to chapter eight. Now, this is an amazing thing right here. Eli's sons don't surprise me because Eli wasn't all that. But Samuel, Samuel was a great man of God. From 
From birth, he was dedicated to the Lord. He took the Nazarite vow. He served in the temple with Eli as a little boy. He was probably one of the greatest leaders Israel ever had. Samuel. You couldn't say anything bad about Samuel. But look at his kids. He's the disappointed father. I don't understand this. Verse 1 of chapter 8. Came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of the second Abijah. They were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. How, can some, how could Samuel's kids turn out that way? How could they turn out, out that way? They were rotten too. Now that's disappointing. But we see that all the time. Because kids grow up and they have their own will and they make their own choices. And you can raise them the best of your ability and they come to Sunday school and they come to Awana and they come to VBS and they come to church and you can do all that you can and they can still stray away and you're disappointed lots of parents are like that they're disappointed why did my kids turn out this way how could a deacon raise demons two D's disappointed father a disappointed father. I raised ingrates. I gave my kids everything. And today, Father's Day, I don't even get a phone call. I don't get a card. I don't get a, a, a meal. I raised ingrates. I'm disappointed. At least I got a flashlight. I, I got to get two more of them, real quick. Judges, the enabling father. You're going to see yourself in here, some of you guys probably. I don't want to get personal, I don't really know, but maybe. Judges 14, verse 1. Samson, big, strong, good-looking Samson, went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. She's an unbeliever. Samson is a Nazarite. Samson is an, a Hebrew. He's an Israelite. He goes down and checks out this one beautiful girl from the Philistines. So he came back and told his father and mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as a wife. And the father and mother said to him, just like you've said to your sons many times, don't, don't, don't touch that. Get away from that. That's evil. But they go for it anyway. And it bites. Just like you told them it was going to bite. And they tell him, is there no woman among the daughters of your relatives or among our people that you go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she looks good to me. He doesn't know her character, her family. She's an unbeliever. She's from the Philistines. They don't even speak the same language. Go get her for me because what? She looks good. She's beautiful. And his parents do it. They do it. They make it happen. Because they're enabling Samson. He pays the price. Now let's close on this. This is the good one. Joshua. He is the convinced father. Joshua 24 verse 15. 
This is Joshua. Let's close on a high note. Forget the enabling fathers and the permissive fathers. And we, we didn't even do the favoritism father. You can do that on your own. That's uh, Isaac and his wife. We didn't have time for that. But look at the convinced father. Verse 15. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, you do your thing. You do you. Choose for yourself today what you will serve. I can't help, I can't force you to serve my God. You do you. But, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. You want to be worldly, an unbelieving, unstable man or woman? That's on you. As for me and my house, we're going to continue serving the Lord. That's the kind of father that you can emulate. A, conv a convinced, consistent, committed father. To the end of life, stay committed to God. Your kids stray away, maybe they come back, maybe the grandkids come back. You just keep on fighting the good fight of faith. Maybe you end up with your grandkids, like Gilbert and Margaret. They're, they're, they're doing this on faith. They raised a lot of kids, but they had a lot more energy back then. A lot more energy. But they're saying, God, give me the energy, especially Gilbert. Give me the energy that I need, the strength. I want to do it again. I want to infuse a new, a new generation again. Praise God for them. You can do it too. You can do that with your grandkids. Your kids are making a mess. Say, you know what? Let me pick them up on Sunday. Let me take them. You guys stay home if you want. Let me help you with them and you bring them. Cecilia brings a whole tribe of them on Wednesday night. Half of EBS is coming out of her car. <laughs> then when she's done with them, she starts bringing neighbors. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And her kid said, tell pastor, please, please, don't, t don't tear out the old equipment out there. The old playground equipment, we love it. So it's only temporary. Temporarily tearing it out to put the new in and we'll put, maybe put the, new, the old back in with the new. Who knows? No promises. It's going to be nice. Well, with that, we will close. Fathers, happy Father's Day. We commend you. Many of our fathers are gone. Many of them have did their time on this earth. And Lord willing, they're enjoying themselves up in glory. But you and I are still here. And your days of active fathering may be over, but you can still be a father figure. Not only to your own biological kids, but to other kids in the church. Be a father figure. Be a man. Not a wimp. Be a man with character, with conviction, with integrity. Be like Noah. Stand up in this crooked and perverse generation and be a pillar. Be strong. Say, I've, I've done raising my kids, but I want to make sure this church stays what? Strong. That's my commitment. Strong.